Okay, so this is uh, our great pleasure to welcome today Carl Craver. Uh, Carl was supposed to visit us uh, in uh, Bordeaux, France uh, this spring. We were so excited about it, but the current situation decided otherwise. So we, um, you know, Carl was very nice accepting to uh, give a talk by Zoom because we thought it was great to uh, listen to what Carl has to say, which is always super interesting. And also one thing we thought was important was to develop some interactions between the kind of philosophy of neuroscience that Carl does and the neuroscience in Bordeaux and of course elsewhere, but I'm happy to see that some of you neuroscientists from uh, Bordeaux uh, were available today for uh, attending this, uh, this talk. So um, just a few words to say what you probably all know, namely that Carl Craver is one of the most important philosophers of science and philosophers of biology Internationally, he's a professor at WashU, Washington University in the US. He's a specialist of the philosophy of neuroscience, but also has broad interest in philosophy of biology and philosophy of science more generally. He's the author of a very influential book called uh, Explaining the Brain uh, that was uh, published in 2007. And another book together with Linda Darden uh, in 2014, entitled Searching for Mechanisms, Discoveries Across the Life Sciences. Something which is um, extremely important and striking in Carl's work is that Carl's, Carl uh, does some uh, observations, experiments uh, with uh, a scientist, and this is a very distinctive feature of Carl's work to be strongly connected with science, even with experimental aspects of science. Currently, Carl works on episodic memory, and he's uh, writing a book uh, on the distinctive contribution that episodic memory makes to our lives as persons. And this is exactly the topic that Carl is going to talk about today. As you know, the talk is entitled Episodic Memory and Time, beyond the mnemic necessity hypothesis. Thank you so much, Carl, for accepting our virtual invitation and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for the opportunity to present uh, this work to you guys today. Uh, this work will come out of the fourth chapter of the book that Thomas mentioned. It's currently in progress. And I should say that, uh, uh, that my collaborator, Shana Rosenbaum, and I are increasingly uh, working together on the remaining chapters. And I'm very excited to announce that ultimately this book will be a co-authored book between me and Shana Rosenbaum, who's a well-known neuropsychologist working on episodic memory and decision-making quite generally. I do wish I could be there in person. I had hoped to be in Bordeaux for uh, an extended stay this summer. Hopefully that will happen uh, someday. And thanks to Toma and to Cedric for all of their encouragement and enthusiasm for this. Um, before I begin the talk, I, I want to point out that I realized yesterday that today is Emancipation Day for many European colonies. We celebrate that here on June 19th. We call it Juneteenth. Uh, but this is the day in 1848 that the Danish West Indies officially ended the legal practice of enslavement. Chattel enslavement would continue as an institution in the U.S. for another 17 years. Uh, my talk today, embarrassingly, has nothing to do with emancipation or social justice. And I've only just begun to think about how my work on episodic memory dovetails with work on social justice. But in remembrance of this day, I want to begin with a few brief remarks. Avishai Margali argues persuasively that remembering is a form of caring. We remember things that we care about. And conversely, when we care about things, we make a point of remembering them. Marguerite emphasizes that communities are formed in part through what they remember, what they care to remember, and how they remember it. What we choose to learn, what we prioritize in our memory, what we refuse to forget, as well as what we choose to ignore and hide from ourselves, define us as a culture. In the US, our memorial relationship to slavery, to Jim Crow, and to violence in policing is characterized by the most outrageous forms of distortion and breathtaking efforts at censure and erasure. So I wanna take a moment to remember in name only, 10 people who died because of the legacy of chattel slavery and its repressed memory that continues to haunt my city, my state, my country, and the world. 
These names are increasingly familiar to us in the US, and I'm happy to say around the world, but let's take a moment to remember them before we begin. George Floyd, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Adetania Jefferson, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and many other names that I could mention. Our collective spirit is formed in both healthy and pathological societies by what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget. Today, my focus is on how memory contributes to the distinctive lives of individual persons, not societies. It's commonly said that memories make us who we are, that they anchor us in time, and that, and some even say, that episodic memory is required for the water of time in which we all seem to live. My talk is really about how we connect humans understood as agents and epistemic agents and moral agents, how we understand the place of those in a world that's understood exclusively in causal terms. Human beings you know, from the neuroscientific and biological perspective are understood as assemblages of, asso of dissociable causal capacities and mechanisms, not primarily as things that make choices, undertake commitments, uh, have responsibilities and obligations to one another. Um, the, to understand that connection, to understand how it is that the space of reasons and the space of causes can co-inhabit the world of ours, we face a conceptual question and an empirical question. On the conceptual side, we have to ask, what must one be able to do to deserve the status of an agent, a thinker, uh, a, a morally responsible person? You know, for instance, must they be able to construct counterfactuals or orient themselves in time, form life narratives? But then there's also an empirical question can people with specific cognitive deficits do precisely those things? Now, episodic memory is a common topic in psychology these days. And episodic memory, just to, to sketch it briefly, is a memory for events that is accompanied by awareness that you previously experienced that event. And for perhaps obvious reasons, many philosophers, most notably Locke, have argued that this form of memory is central to our sense of self, and also that it's central to our epistemology. How could we know anything, one might think, if we can't remember the experiences that we've had? If you're an empiricist, especially, memory for experiences plays a foundational role in everything that we know. And some psychologists and quite a few philosophers have made the claim that episodic memory is distinctively human. And if that's the case, perhaps episodic memory holds important clues for how humans manage to be distinct from other non-human animals. In fact, people often describe non-human animals as stuck in time, perhaps related to the fact that they don't have episodic memory. So Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kohler, Kohler, for example, said the time in which the chimpanzee li lives is limited in past and future. Merlin Donald goes farther, farther and says that the lives of apes are lived entirely in the present. Lauren Isley claims that animals are molded by natural forces they do not camp comprehend to their minds. There is no past and no future, only the everlasting present of a single generation, its trials in the forest, its hidden pathways in the air and in the sea. Now you can connect that thought about non-human organisms who lack episodic memory and also lack a sense of time to human beings who have, have because of uh, 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 things that happened at birth or because of accidents, lost their episodic memories. So Roberts asks in 2002, do animals have a sense of time, episodic memory, and an ability to cognitively project activities into the future? Or are animals permanently similar to KC, who's an amnesic that we'll be talking about in just a second, and to children under the age of four? Could animals be largely stuck in a permanent present with little ability to remember past episodes or plan for activities in the future? Dalla Barba and Lacourt argue that people who've lost their episodic memory and mental time travel along with it lose their entire subjective temporality. And Endel Talbing, in the book that introduced the concept of episodic memory, notes that we can, if we wish, close our eyes and think about what we did 10 minutes ago or how we celebrated our last birthday. And we can think about what we might be doing tomorrow or next year. This kind of sense of time makes a huge difference to what we are and how we live. If we retained all our other mental capacities but lost the awareness of time in which our lives are played out, we might still be uniquely different from all other animals, but we would no longer be human as we understand it. The, the striking parallels here are, are shocking both for their 
political chargedness, I think, um, comparing people with amnesia to, to non-human animals such as rats and chimpanzees, um, uh, but also for the striking claim that they make about the role of episodic memory in our lives as persons. And that, that idea, of course, is, is commonly repeated uh, throughout the popular literature. Many of you have seen the movie Memento, which is about a guy who has an episodic memory deficit. The film is shot in a disjointed time. We get the sense that he's lost all sense that his life fits together into an orderly series of events. Sue Corkin, who spent years doing research on HM, perhaps the most famous amnesic subject, titled her biography of HM Permanent Present Tense as a way of marking the fact that people with amnesia must be stuck in time. And I, I won't talk about Clive Waring but, that much, but in the bottom right-hand corner, you, you see a, a bit from his diary where he writes time and time again, one, one line after the next, now I am perfectly awake for the first time. And then he scratches it out and then he writes again, now I am perfectly awake for the first time. And these things resonate with the idea that people who've lost their episodic memory are somehow disoriented in time, don't have a future, don't have a past. And some people are quite explicit about this. Wittgenstein said that a person learns the concept of the past by remembering. So if you didn't have the capacity to remember from the beginning, you would never learn the concept of the past in the first place. Russell agrees, but for the fact of memory in this, in this sense, that is episodic memory, we should not know that there was ever a past at all, nor should we be able to understand the word past any more than a man born blind could understand the word light. In fact, I think a person who's blind can understand the word light, but we'll discuss that in just a second. Christoph Hurl more recently in 2002-17 argues that people with amnesia could not form a sense of the A series, uh, nor could they form a realist sense of time as a container for events in which their lives played out. Sudendorf and Karbalas uh, support this idea. They're famous uh, psychologists working on this and they say mental time travel, which is another term for episodic memory, could have been responsible for the concept of time itself. And Craig Callender in a recent book on time says memory is absolutely critical to our experience of time. I say all of this just to make it clear that there's a strong intuitive con conception both in science and in philosophy and in pop popular connection between our ability to remember the past and our understanding of time. And philosophers have long wondered where our concept of time comes from, and it would be a, a striking achievement if we were able to say that the distinctly human sense of time, of past, present, and future, and the idea that time flows in some way, could be explained in terms of a cognitive capacity such as episodic memory that we've been studying for over 40 years at this point. My method is dissociation. It turns out that none of these people who've made these grand claims ever looked at people who had lost their episodic memories and asked what they know about time. And my entire methodology turns on one simple trick uh, in dissociation, that you can lose capacity A while maintaining capacity B. And if that's the case, A is not necessary for B, causally. Um, this is a form of causal independence. It's a single dissociation. And almost every argument that I'm gonna make in this talk relies on precisely that form of inference. Episodic memory can be selectively damaged leaving many aspects of one's sense of time and one's uh, feeling of time intact. Therefore, episodic memory is not necessary for these aspects of one's sense of time. Wittgenstein, Russell, Calendar have an intuition that turns out to be false when you test it. All right, um, uh, I have to point out that there's something important about this methodology. I'm not gonna be doing any localization of function here. I'm not trying to figure out what the hippocampus does or what its function is in the cognitive ontology. I'm merely pointing out that if an individual with episodic memory, uh, episodic amnesia succeeds on a task, then you can infer that episodic memory is not necessary for success on that task, a very direct form of inference. If, on the other hand, an individual with episodic amnesia fails on a task, one cannot infer that episodic memory is necessary for success on that task, because it might well be that these people have damage to other systems as well, or that they've had long-term consequences of living at home with their parents that are responsible for these deficits. So any negative result here uh, has to be further explained. But in our case, when we find out that they succeed on these tasks, that constrains any positive story that we can possibly tell about the place of episodic memory in our lives as persons. So here's how I'm going to start. I first want to just very quickly introduce KC, one, the, the main amnesic that I'll be talking about, though we've done work on several amnesics, uh, and introduce the concept of episodic memory for people who aren't already perfectly familiar with it. Then I'm going to go through some different ways of thinking about time. Semantic knowledge of both the A series and the B series, um, temporal perspective in ethics. I will look at uh, impulsivity and risk. 
I will look at whether people with amnesia can assign value to future rewards. I will look at whether people with amnesia can anticipate regretting future decisions that they've made. And in the end, uh, you can probably already guess what's going to happen. I'm going to claim that all of this is preserved in episodic memory. So the sense that they're somehow stuck in a permanent present or incapable of acquiring time is, is simply false. Individuals with amnesia are not stuck in time. We need to dump that metaphor. The nemic necessity hypothesis is false. Much of the human sense of time is preserved in episodic amnesia. The hippocampus and the MTL system is probably not a time machine, as people like Dalla Barba and Lacourt and um, uh, Sudendorf and Carvalis argue. All right, first, introducing KC. KC, uh, this is a picture of KC and his family. Um, uh, uh, many of the people in the picture, his mom is sitting there, his father's sitting there, his brothers, uh, and one of his brother's new wife. This is his brother's wedding. Casey can name all of the people in this photograph, and he can infer that there must be a wedding going on. But when he looks at the picture, he suddenly uh, starts to wonder, what's going on with my hair? Um, uh, and the reason that he's perplexed is that he doesn't normally have a permanent. And it turns out that the night before his brother's wedding, Kent, uh, Kent Cochran is his name, uh, Kent, he's now dead, um, uh, Kent Cochran decided to surprise his family by getting his first ever uh, permanent and then showed up for the wedding wearing this uh, hairdo. Um, uh, the family remembers it. He has no memory of having done this. He also doesn't remember being evicted from his home when the train crashed in the backyard. He doesn't remember being on the boat when his brother died in a boating accident. Uh, he has no memory so far as we can tell for any event over the course of his entire life. Um, he has anterior grade semantic deficits in the sense that he has difficulty learning new semantic information and complete deficits in learning new episodic memories. Um, it's also clear that he's got a bunch of cortical atrophy. This is a terrible case for localization of function. He does have bilateral damage to the medial temporal lobes, including the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyri, but he has uh, damage to many other areas uh, of the brain besides, as one might expect from a, a really traumatic uh, motorcycle accident. Um, the gist of what, what, what was really striking about Kent is despite that widespread damage, his, his uh, uh, cognitive deficits seem to be relatively narrow, narrow to the ability to remember these events from his past. He seems to have lost memories of past personal events that are accompanied by awareness that he previously experienced those events. When Envil Tolving first characterized this kind of memory, he described it as being personal, highly experiential, perhaps something like a movie playing in the mind's eye, that these memories tend to be rather emotional and so hot on that uh, spectrum. They tend to be organized spatially and temporally uh, rather than conceptually. So you could remember riding a roller coaster, for example, and you might remember ascending the first hill and then a series of dips and turns afterwards. And as you organize that in your mind's eye, you're having something like an, a, an episodic memory. Semantic memory, like the day that today is Emancipation Day, is a memory for facts, past, present, or future. They need not be in your past. These tend to be propositional rather than experiential. I remember that today is Emancipation Day, but I do not remember the emancipation. In fact, I wasn't even alive during the emancipation. These memories tend to be cold, although they could be accompanied by hot emotions. They tend to just be facts. Columbus is the capital of Ohio, Paris is in France, etc. And they tend to be conceptually organized by in, of, relations, for example. Um, this has been accompanied, uh, this, this literature on episodic memory has increasingly expanded quite a bit with the discovery that people with episodic memory deficits also have difficulty thinking about the future. So episodic memory has come to be used almost synonymously with the idea of mental time travel, the ability to transport oneself mentally in time backwards and forwards. Initially, it was hypothesized that perhaps episodic memory was involved in all forms of simulation. Imagine remembering what you did in the past, imagining what you will do in the future, imagining the world from somebody else's perspective or for some, from some other different point of view. It turns out that this hasn't worked out entirely well. Um, uh, being able to imagine the world from another person's point of view or to read other minds 
clearly does not depend on episodic memory. People with episodic amnesia understand sarcasm, understand facial expressions, can complete, stor complete stories in ways that show that they understand what's going on in the minds of other people. So the idea that somehow this skill is involved in mind reading has turned out to be false. But the idea that it's involved in projecting backwards in time, forwards in time, and perhaps to other spatial locations is still very much a live hypothesis in the literature. And this became a live hypothesis in part because of the way that Endel Talding described his conversation with Kent one day. He said to Kent, let's try the question again about the future. What will you be doing tomorrow? And Casey says, smiling faintly, I don't know. Well, do you remember the question uh, about what I'll be doing tomorrow? Yeah, how would you describe your state of mind when you try to think about it? And then Casey pauses for five seconds and he says, blank, I guess. In, in other circumstances, he says, it's like being asleep or it's a big blankness sort of thing, or it's like being in a room with nothing there and having a guy tell you to go find a chair and there's nothing there. It's like swimming in the middle of a lake. There's nothing there to hold you up or do anything with. This is probably why I think Oliver Sacks describes Jimmy G, the lost mariner, in The Man Who Mistook His Wife for the Hat, as a, a lost mariner, adrift on a sea of time, with no sense of the future that's unfolding before him and no sense of the fact past that's disappeared behind him. Right now, I think that all of those things add to why we have this common intuition, or they, they reflect this common intuition that we have. But the, the intuition has never been tested, not by scientists and not by philosophers. So we thought it was time to begin testing it, Shana and I, and we began a series of experiments, and that's what I want to tell you about now. The first and most easy ones, which were really come up uh, with when uh, an undergraduate student and I were reading Christoph Hurl's classic 1998 piece in which he argues that people with uh, episodic memory could never understand the idea that time flows from the past to the future. Um, uh, we were reading it and we thought, well, why don't we just ask them? <laughs> um, why don't we just see what they know about time? Anyhow, just for the backup, um, Hurl's argument is all couched in terms of a language um, that comes from metaphysics, actually, from McTaggart's work on the metaphysics of time. He distinguishes the A series and the B series. It's subtle, but important. Um, the A series is the idea that time is categorized indexically so that there are certain things that happened in the past relative to now, certain things that happened in the future relative to now, and certain things that happen simultaneously with respect to the now. And the idea of the A series is associated with the idea that the present is like moving forward and gobbling up the future and leaving the past behind, never to be encountered again. Um, in order to test that, we wanted to look at whether they understand the words about past, present, and future, whether they understand that time has direction, and whether they understand that there's a causal asymmetry in time, that things in the past can cause things in the future, but things in the future cannot cause things in the past. Another way of thinking about time that McTaggart discusses is what's known as the B series. This is co a common way that physicists might think about time. Time in the B series is understood as a sequence of events arranged as earlier or later than one another. So you've got a timeline and events that could be earlier and later, but there is no index to the present according to which part of time is relegated to the past, part of it is relegated to the future. So do people with amnesia have a concept of the A series or the B series? Well, let's start with the B series. That's the easiest one. We gave Kent a whole series of uh, events from his life, some of which he remembers and some of which he does not. Uh, his graduation day, um, uh, his uh, working at the plant, etc. We had him draw at the right end, um, uh, uh, at the end of his timeline, which he did dutifully as 1981. And then we asked him to order the events of his life on that timeline in order. And what's really striking is that for the most part, he gets the order of those events exactly right. The few events that he gets wrong, those are the circled ones, are either events in which he lost consciousness, such as the time that he wrecked his motorcycle, or the time that he um, uh, wrecked his Volkswagen bug, or the time that he was hit on the head by a bale of hay. All of those times he lost consciousness and sustained brain injuries of some sort. Or there are events that he um, uh, didn't attend, like the 1967 uh, uh, Expo. He also doesn't remember giving himself a permanent, it turns out. But uh, the other events he lost consciousness for. So he's able to take the events of his life and put them on a timeline. And that timeline, while not perfect, nonetheless puts them in pretty much 
the right order for the rest of his life. Stan Klein had a patient known as DB, who, and, and on the basis of experiments with him, st talked about the difference between a lived past and a known past. We can know things about our past, like I know that I was born in Massachusetts in 1967, but I, didn't, I don't have a lived memory of that past. Similarly, it would be reasonable to expect that somebody with episodic amnesia might really know quite a bit about their past, where they lived at various times, where they worked, where they went to high school, what their address was, etc. They would know that in semantic memory, but they might not remember having been to that school, worked at that job, or lived at that address. But they can clearly order things in time, which indicates some understanding of how time works. So we decided to ask KC further about the A series, whether he understood semantically what's going on. And I think that the conversation, though brief, illustrates that he's got it perfectly well. We asked, what's the future? He says, oh, there are events that haven't happened yet. And what's the past? Well, those are events that have already happened. Can you change the past? No. <laughs> um, can you change the future? Yeah, how? Oh, by doing different things. And you asked him, uh, does what happened in the past influence what happens in the future? And KC says, yes. Uh, does what you know do now happens, uh, or does what you do now influence what happens in the future? Casey says, uh, I guess so. Does what you do now change what happened in the past? No. Can something that happens in the future change what has happened in the past? No. Well, if an event is in the future, will it always be in the future? He says, no. And then we said, why? And he says, well, because time moves on. <laughs> Once an event is in the past, will it always stay in the past? And he says, yes. Um, so, so all of these questions you can see are trying to get at something like the irre irrevocability of the past, a temporal order to the flow of time, and the idea that there's an asymmetry, that you can't uh, influence the past by changing things in the future. To get at that directly, we asked some, some, some scenarios. We said, suppose that someone commits a murder, is it possible for them to undo what they did at some future time? And KC says, no. That question is especially important because it forms the basis of Hurl's argument. He says that a person with amnesia could not possibly understand that the past is irrevocable. We asked him, have you ever read a story about time traveling? Can you say what it means to travel in time? And KC paused for a while and he said, well, it just means to take a body and move it to a previous era. So Casey's conceptual knowledge of time was flawless on this task. And I wanna point out that we've now replicated that study in two other cases of acquired amnesia, people who as adults have had brain damage and lost their episodic memories entirely. So their conceptual knowledge is intact. So either episodic memory is unnecessary for semantic knowledge of the A series or KC, DA, and DB, the people on whom we've replicated all of this, acquired their semantic knowledge of the A series before their brain damage. So in order to, to probe this a little bit further, we actually wanted to get, our, uh, get access to some people who have a lifelong episodic memory deficit, people who, for instance, had an anoxic event at birth that caused hippocampal damage, and they never really developed a hippocampus or the capacity to store episodic memories at all. These are very complicated conversations. These guys are much more loquacious than, than KC is. Um, the two people that we talked to here are HC, who's in uh, Canada, and John, who's in the UK, and studied by uh, Farine Vardakadam. I'm really grateful to her for sharing this data with me. But let's just look at a few examples if we think about the A series. Could you give an example of something that happened in the past? Well, if you ask them, you, I won't read through these in detail. If you want, you can look at the slides yourself. But they get the questions exactly right. What is the past? What is the future? Do you know what is the past? Could you give an example of something is, that's in the past? In fact, you can see again that John here, who's never had an episodic memory in his life, knew that the Queen's Golden Jubilee was something that happened in the past, but apparently when asked to describe, and, and he said that he had been there to watch the Queen go by on her float, but he couldn't tell you, you where he was in London when he watched her go by on the Thames. And apparently if you're from London, you know where you were on the Thames. He also knows general facts about the past, or HC did. She knew that men walked on the moon, for example, or that she went snorkeling with her mom and her sister. But again, if you ask them for details about that, they're unable to fill it in. If you ask them what the future is, though, they say it's something that hasn't happened yet, or it's tomorrow and all the days after, they get all of these questions exactly right. If we say once an event is in the past, will it always stay in the past? Um, or if an event is in the future, will it always be in the future? John says no, because if it's got a date to happen, then eventually that time will come and it will be in the present and then in the past, um, uh, suggesting that time moves and that he gets this idea. Sometimes they really get quite elaborate about these. John has some background in physics that allows, or at least in comic book physics, 
that allows him to, to speculate about what's going on here. We ask him to, to you know, ask, we ask him if an, if an event is in the past, if it will always stay in the past. And he says, no, no, not if you, well, it depends if you could, like I said about travel with like, well, the answer is yes, but with space and things, if you could travel, I think he means fast enough. If you could travel fast enough, you could see things that like you could see the past. So yes, the answer is no. But, and then the interviewer intervenes, Fahrenheit Varga Kadam intervenes, and she said, is there any way that you could take the past and move it from the past to either the present or the future? And he says, not that I know of. It doesn't mean that it's not possible. She says, like something that you may have done in the past, and he says, oh yeah, you could move it that way. You could record it or something, but that's not moving it. Um, so yes, you can move it by that means, but not the other means. You get the idea. He's talking, whether he's right about these things is a separate question from whether he's talking intelligibly about them. And clearly he's talking as intelligibly about these things as, uh, as an undergraduate would. Can you change the past, we asked him. Uh, uh, he says, well, it is possible to change the past by going back in time, but only if you can travel fast enough. And at the moment we can't. So the answer is no, we can't change the, the past. But yes, he, he definitely gets the idea. We ask if you can change the future. He's similarly confused about this one. Well, change the future only by if you think, if you think certain things are going to happen in your life and they don't, just because different things happen, that's kind of changing the future, but it's not. The answer is still no, like you can't change the past because although you can try to change the future, like you see in films and things, people try and change the future per se, by their very, by their very actions they do, by doing something different, they change the future anyway. So yes, you can change the future, but in a way the answer is also no, because the future is not defined. So if it's not defined, you can't change it anyway. So the answer is still no, no, you can't change the future. That is a confusing answer, no doubt but it's confusing in all the right ways. Uh, it suggests deep understanding of what's being asked and an attempt to play with it in the way that a philosopher does, not somebody who has no, con no concept of the A series, no concept of the past, present, and future. So either episodic memory, and remember, these are people who've never had an episodic memory. So either episodic memory is unnecessary to acquire conceptual knowledge of the A series, or individuals with developed am mental amnesias build conceptual knowledge of the A series from what few episodic memories they happen to have. Knowledge of the A-series, however, might be thought to be semantic knowledge. These are facts about the definitions of terms and the way that these terms are used. If an experiential component is necessary to acquire that semantic knowledge of time, it would seem that the, 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 the contours of working memory would be more than sufficient to house the passage of time in which this knowledge would be uh, uh, maintained. Certainly, we don't need the long-term stores of episodic memory for that purpose. All right, that shows that they have conceptual knowledge of time, but do they care about it? Your intuition might be that they know that there's a past, a present, and a future, but if they can't imagine the future or remember the past, then they couldn't invest it with value at all. And you might predict that people with episodic amnesia will exhibit a kind of myopic focus on the present with little concern for their past or the future. You might expect them to be present hedonists, this is what Philip Zimbardo calls people who are oriented towards the hedonistic present. They're self-indulgent pleasure seekers and shirk all exacting work. Zimbardo himself says that he's a present hedonist, and I certainly have a component of present hedonism in me. I have very little of this one. You might also think that people with episodic amnesia could be fatalists. After all, they've been living at home with their parents for the last 30 years, and they have a very severe cognitive deficit. You might think that if they can't imagine the future or remember the past, they should think that nothing that they do um, matters at all. Um, to get at this, we gave them a test that Philip Zimbardo uh, developed for the purposes of sorting people into different attitudes about the past, present, and future. Some of us are very future-oriented and think about the future a lot and getting our work done before we go out and play. Some of us like to go out and play before we get our work done. Some of us dwell in the past, and when we do, we think about how awful things have been. Some of us dwell in the past, but think about how wonderful and idyllic our childhoods were. And these questions are all designed to assay people's positions on a ranking of attitudes towards the past. Uh, well, to be, to be clear, they can be uh, negative about the past, positive about the past, reading across the top of this diagram, uh, negative about the past, positive about the past, fatalistic about the present, hedonistic about the present, or future-oriented planning for tomorrow. So we gave that series of questions to 
uh, KC, DA, and DG, who all had acquired amnesia, and to HC, who has developmental amnesia. The red dotted line in this diagram represents, uh, well, it says ideal at the bottom. It's really Zimbardo's idea of the good, night, good life. For him, the good life would be uh, very low on negativity about the past, very high on positivity about the past, uh, very low on measures of present fatalism, high on present hedonism, and relatively high on future orientation. In this graph, the 50th percentile, the mean, is right here, right across the middle. And what we're really looking at here and what we really care about is the question, where do they stand on fatalism and hedonism? Is it the case that being an episodic amnesia, amnesic leaves you somehow um, uh, blind to the future and so focused entirely on the present or fatalistic? And what you'll see is that KC, who's in blue here, is at absolute floor on present hedonism and near the floor on present fatalism. In fact, all of their highest orientations are, are towards the future, <laughs> not the past, except for, I guess, this one. Um, this is HC, whose highest orientation is towards her positivity about her past that she can't remember anything about. But importantly, nobody seems to be particularly uh, pathological in the, in the bad direction on fatalism or hedonism. In fact, their dominant temporal orientation team seems mostly to be either past positivity or future orientation. So episodic amnesics um, are, if they're trapped in the present, they're trapped there with knowledge that there's a, a future and a past, um, and knowledge that time is flowing, and knowledge of the A series and the B series, and they're also trapped there with, with concern for the future and the past. Episodic amnesics do not avow a hedonistic temporal orientation. They are not notably fatalistic. Um, but you might say, okay, well, they know how to answer these questions. They're being asked by somebody to give moral judgments about how they should orient themselves in time. And it's not surprising that what you get are relatively conventional answers. Do they actually make decisions that, are, that comport with these temporal perspectives? So in order to do that, we wanted to not just ask them about their temporal attitudes, but actually measure their temporal attitudes by putting them in task situations. Now, if you have the intuition that these people are trapped in a permanent present, you might think that a person who cannot imagine a personal future will choose entirely impulsively. Why should I not, if there's no tomorrow, why should I not eat this cupcake after all? If there's no two hours from now, why should I not eat this cupcake? It's a reasonable prediction. And you might also think that people of this sort would be risk-taking because the, the future consequences of their actions can't be brought into the present for the purposes of calculating what one should do. You might think that a person who can't imagine their personal future can't imagine those consequences and so would be prone to making risky choices in the present. And indeed, Sudendorf and Corbalis claim that mental time travel gives us knowledge of our own mortality. Um, uh, I don't know why you would need episodic memory for that, because we don't remember our own deaths. But uh, 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 nonetheless, uh, if you thought that, you might think that you, the people with episodic amnesia would be real uh, uh, risk takers and, and behaving in ways that have no concern for their activity. And in fact, if you look at the recent literature on things like divorce or uh, drug addiction, um, uh, you'll find uh, numerous references to the idea that somehow a shortened temporal perspective, perhaps having to do with memory and episodic memory in, in particular, are perhaps implicated in uh, one's susceptibility to uh, those forms of short-sighted behavior. Um, and that's, again, a very intuitive idea. So in order to test that intuitive idea, rather than just running with it, uh, we gave uh, to a number of people with, uh, first with KC, but now to a number of others, um, a test uh, to, of impulsivity. This is kind of a cool task uh, known as the float and gambling task. And the point of this task is to separate two constructs that are very close together. Uh, on the one hand, impulsivity, and on the other hand, risk taking. By impulsivity, we mean the tendency to choose at the first, to, to act at the first available moment for action, not delaying your action. By being risk prone, we mean the tendency to choose behaviors that are inherently risky, that have, um, that, that, you know, to choose uh, low probability but high payout outcomes, for example. And this task pits those two things to, against one another by giving them a choice from a screen um, on the screen, they are presented with a series of cards, either in an ascending or a descending order. 
In the ascending order, they first get one card, then a second card, then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth. In the descending presentation, they get five cards, it goes down to four, it goes down to three, it goes down to two, it goes down to one. And at any moment in that presentation, the subject is able to tap the screen and stop the presentation of cards. At that point, the cards are turned over, and if the winning card is in your hand at the time that you touch the screen, you win a reward, and that reward is inversely proportional to the number of cards that are on the screen when you tapped it. So a consequence of this is that somebody who's very impulsive should, should well, it's, it's shown on this picture. Somebody who's very impulsive, uh, shown on the, on the left-hand side, should pick when there are many cards present in the subtract condition, that is when, when there are five cards present in the subtract condition, and when there are one or two cards present in the add condition. Somebody who's a risk taker, in contrast, should in both of those conditions choose when there are very few cards to maximize their payout, even though the probability of achieving that payout is low. And if they're neither, we should expect them to uh, 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 look like this middle diagram. And in fact, KC looks exactly like this middle diagram and doesn't look anything like the measures of impulsivity and risk taking. If anything, KC seems to be a little more cautious in his decision, slightly more conservative, waiting for more cards to be present rather than few. We also looked at their ability, individuals with amnesics ability to calculate probabilities. Is it the case that, you know, we all have the tendency to discount the value of reward as the odds against receiving that reward diminish. So low, low uh, probability bets uh, are worth less than high probability bets to us if you keep the amount of the bet constant. Here we have, uh, uh, this is a somewhat complicated diagram, but it can be simplified as follows. The top uh, represents choices uh, where people are dealing with a, a maximum amount of $250. And the bottom are all cases where we ask them with the maximum amount of $2,000. We wanted to see if the amount makes a difference in these cases. And what you can see is, except in this one case, all of these lines are, oh, and I should tell you that, um, this is KC and DA who are similarly aged. They were in their 60s at the time of this test. HC was in her 30s at the time of test and DG was in his 40s. So we needed different controls for these different people. But for the most part, you can see that the lines of their choice behavior you know, conform entirely with the kind of curves that one would expect uh, from, a, from a typical subject. DA was a much shallower discounter here, and I should point out that DA is an accountant in, in real life and was probably actually just calculating the odds. In fact, his answers seem to comport with that very well. So episodic amnesics are not prone to impulsive behavior, at least on the task that we gave them there, and episodic amnesics are not prone to risk-taking as measured on the floating task and the probabilistic discounting tasks. Oops. Another measure that people use of impulsivity is intertemporal choice. We all have a tendency, just as we de discount the value of a reward with the odds against receiving it, we also discount the value of reward with the time that it will take us to receive that reward. So that as the receipt of that reward um, uh, makes its way further and further, further into the future, we drop the value of the, the reward correspondingly. We're all very different in that. Those of us who are present hedonists tend to discount in a rather steep way. People who are uh, uh, more future oriented, you might think, will tend to discount in a relatively shallow way. But we all engage in this discounting behavior. Now, what does that have to do with episodic memory? Well, you might think, on the one hand, that if people with episodic memory are trapped in the present with no concept of a past or a future, they don't care about the past or the future, they really are located in the present, then you might expect that episodic future thought is what allows us to pre-experience rewards and punishments and combat the tendency to discount the future. Pascal Boyer has precisely that hypothesis. He thinks mental time travel evolved precisely because when we imagine future experiences, punishments, or rewards, we then can pre-experience the hedonic value of that, import it into the present, weigh that against our present circumstances, and make decisions that are more directed towards communal behavior. If that's the case, then individuals with episodic amnesia should discount the future more steeply than do controls. Alternatively, you might think that people discount the future because they imagine the pain of waiting for it. That was Luhmann's 
um, uh, analysis of why people discount the future. Um, so, so the future is the, that cupcake a week from now is less valuable in part because I have to take the value of the cupcake and then subtract out all of the pain that I experienced between now and the eating of the cupcake because I want to eat the cupcake and I cannot. Um, if that's the case, then you might think that people with episodic amnesia wouldn't be able to imagine the pain of waiting for that. And then you would predict that people with episodic amnesia should choose the larger reward regardless of delay because they can't imagine the pain of waiting. Again, we have one of these complicated diagrams, but here the choice is among with a maximum value of 100, delayed over 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, or 500 weeks. And again, we've got KC and DA in this column, HC in this column, and DG in these columns. And what you can see again is that there's no statistically significant difference between people with episo complete episodic amnesia, even people with episodic amnesia from the time that they are born, and the delayed discounting of people who are healthy average controls. If you ask them why, how they're making these decisions, Casey says, I, I don't know. You ask him if it's a gut reaction, he says, yeah. You say, what, what made you decide to take that amount versus that amount? He said, no reason. What would you use it for? No idea. How would you decide what amount to take? He says, well, I think of what's the better deal. Are you thinking about what you would spend it on? He says, no. Is there anything you would spend it on? No. And if you really push him hard and say, come on, what would you spend this money on? He says that he'd, uh, he'd put it in the bank. Or if you really press on him, he'll say he'll spend it on beer, uh, black label beer in particular. If you ask the others, DA says that he made strictly economic decisions accounting for interest rates and inflation. Remember, he's the accountant in the bunch. HC, who's younger and somewhat more... Um, uh, ebullient, ebullient uh, said that she would try to estimate how long she would be able to hold out, and she would, said she would spend the money on her wedding. She was engaged to be married at the time of this experiment. And DG said that they were making it on the basis of gut feeling. Notice that what's happening is that people are, con are considering the future and considering the dropping value of the future without any explicit effort to do so. Episodic amnesics do not always choose the immediate reward. They do not fall off a discounting cliff. They do not discount more steeply than controls. The area under those curves is identical. Episodic projection is not required for one to value future rewards, is the conclusion. But similarly, the fact that they show that discount in counting curves at all, curve at all, suggests that, um, uh, uh, the, the that one of the explanations for discounting is just wrong. Episodic amnesics discount the future despite their inability to imagine the pain of waiting if we take that to be what's going on in episodic amnesics. Episodic imagination and future pain is not necessary to explain the human tendency to discount the value of future rewards systematically, which we learn from studying people with amnesia. Another way of looking at this, in a recent article, um, uh, Christoph Hurl responding to these, these kinds of challenges, he said, yes, yes, but, but people with episodic amnesia can't possibly anticipate regretting some future action because you would have to imagine yourself performing the task and then imagine the consequences and then imagine yourself feeling regret. So I thought, well, what's a good test of, uh, of feeling regret? And I thought, well, there's this thing called the allay paradox, um, uh, which at least on some people's best explanation seems to involve anticipated regret. It's somewhat complicated. Let me just check on how much time I've got here. It looks like I've still got something like five minutes left. So I'll walk you through it really quickly. This is a decision chart. These are outcomes, P, Q, and R. Um, these are probabilities here in this. This is the expected utility on this end. Um, here we have a choice, what, what we're comparing is a choice between A and B to a choice between C and D. The choice between A and B, although it's represented in a complicated form, is a choice between $1 million for certain, that is 100% probability of $1 million, versus a 99% chance of winning something, a 10% chance of winning 5 million, an 89% chance of winning 1 million, and a 1% chance of winning zero. So you can see that the expected utility here is higher than in the first case, but you've got this one possible outcome in which you walk away with zero dollars in this choice. Most people given this choice go with option A because they imagine themselves as the poor schmuck in option B um, uh, who uh, ends up with zero dollars when they could have had uh, walked away with a million 
for uh, 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 easily uh, with no risk at all. Down here in the choice between C and D, we have an 11% chance of $1 million with an 89% chance of $0, or we have a 10% chance of $5 million and a 90% chance of $0. And most people given this choice will very much prefer option D because option D looks like the best thing. Um, uh, and that this you know, the, uh, the, you know the, the difference in probabilities is more than made up for by the change in outcome. Now that all sounds great. Maybe you agreed with those decisions. The thing to notice is that these choices are absolutely identical except for that last column. That is everything on here to the left of the bar is, is exactly the same. And the only thing that we changed in that last column is by adding equal amounts to either side of the, of the first choice. Now, it's an, it's an axiom of decision theory, a fundamental axiom of decision theory, that your preferences between two options should not change when you add equal amounts to both sides of the choice. And as a consequence, the fact that we, we flip in, in, in case A, we prefer B to, or sorry, in, 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 in the first choice, we prefer A to B. In the second choice, we prefer D to C, those choices are identical except for the two million dollar quantities added in column R. And so it's irrational for us to change preferences between the choice between A and B and the choice between C and D. The explanation that people have given for this is that maybe what's going on, and what seems to be going on introspectively, at least in my case, is that I anticipate myself being this poor schmuck who ends up losing the million dollars. And perhaps what I should do if I want to understand why I make this decision is factor in that feeling of regret. So if I take, that's what R1 is, is here and R2 here. Those are um, uh, variables standing for the amount of regret that I would feel. And then the thought is, if you build regret into the picture, that the regret you would feel at having nothing when you could have had an easy million is worth a lot to you, enough that it actually changes the decision so that this is no longer the same choice merely by adding these equal amounts on the other side. It's no longer an identical choice. You've got a difference. The explanation for what's going on here then people who have episodic amnesia should not be able, should not perform this. They should not be um, uh, a lazy in effect uh, because they can't anticipate regret. If Christoph Hurl is correct and individuals with amnesia cannot anticipate regret, then we should expect them to make non alazian decisions. Episodic future thought, according to this way of thinking, is required to anticipate future regret. That's Hurl's hypothesis. Because amphisonic amnesics can't anticipate future regret, they should not make Alasian choices. And in fact, Loomis and Sugden, who had the anticipated regret hypothesis, make this, hypo make this explicit. They say some individuals may experience no regret or rejoicing at all. In these special cases of our theory, we would predict that the individual's behavior would conform with all the conventional axioms of expected utility theory and not exhibit the Alasian uh, behavior. And what we found, I won't go through these detail in much detail because I'm running out of time. What we found is that these people, in fact, are just as lazy as the rest of us. We looked at it for gains. We looked at it for losses. And in both the case of gains and losses, we found that KC um, uh, made choices that were just as lazy as the choices of the rest of us. So either we're lazy for reasons that have nothing to do with anticipated regret. That's certainly possible and prospect theory is one possibility or there are non-episodic means of anticipating regret. Like maybe we semantically anticipate regret, or maybe, maybe we have some kind of automatic projection into the future or automatic decision-making mechanisms that take regret into account. But Hurl and McCormick then responded to that kind of finding. They said, oh yes, they can anticipate regret, but they cannot feel it. Individuals with amnesia cannot feel regret because regret is constituted by historical relations that are inaccessible to amnesics. Regret is necessarily historical. You did something in the past and you feel bad about it. So necessarily they think by intuition, people with amnesia cannot feel regret. But that's just, um, I, I think just not true from my conversations with Casey or my reading about individuals with amnesia. We asked Casey what he thought. What does it mean to regret something? He said, well, it's something you don't like doing or wish that you hadn't done. 
Can you imagine, can you name some things that you might regret? Like, so like you lost a large sum of money. So what are some things that a person might do if they feel regretful about something? He says, well, you try to make it right. And what kinds of things might they do that would show that they are feeling regret? He said, well, you can tell by their tone of voice. And can you describe how these people feel inside? And he said, they would feel mad at themselves. <laughs> um, uh, all of this seems to suggest that Casey has a, a pretty good grasp on this, despite being the most um, densely amnesic, uh, episodically amnesic individual on record. Uh, and when H.M. famously would have moments in the middle of his sessions with, with Brenda Milner and with Sue Corkin, in which he would become concerned that he was, um, uh, had been swearing or behaving inappropriately. You know, right now I'm wondering, have I done or said anything amiss? You see, at this moment, everything looks clear to me. But what happened just before, his soft voice sometimes seems plaintive. He said, that's what worries me. Right? Hurl is just wrong about this. H.M. spent much of his life worried about events that he could no longer remember and worried that he had done things in the past that he could not revoke and that were making him look bad. That, this is an obsession of people with, with episodic amnesia, or at least some of them. All right, so to conclude, what I've shown is that episodic memory is not required to know that there's an A series or B series or to understand those things semantically. Episodic future thought is not required for one to escape a presentist hedonist moral outlook. Episodic future thought is not required for impulse control or rational risk calculation. Episodic future thought is not required to value the future. Episodic future thought does not explain delay discounting. Episodic future thought is likely not required to anticipate regret or short of that to exhibit a lazy in behavior and the certainty effect. Yep, went the wrong way. The take home lessons that I want to leave you with are that amnesic individuals are not stuck in time, that the anemic necessity hypothesis is false. We need a different metaphor for talking about people with amnesia, and it's not that they're trapped in the present. Our sense of, under, of time is underwritten by many cognitive systems, and our philosophical intuitions about the centrality of episodic memory to our lives as persons requires evidence, not merely our intuition. Um, these people, I should point out, are agentially impaired but we don't yet have a clear diagnosis of why they're, uh, why they're impaired and what that impairment tells us about um, uh, the nature of persons and how those persons are implemented in cognitive systems. So to come full circle, when we remember George Floyd and Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray and the like, we're not remembering them episodically. We did not know them personally. We, many of us, do not have a set of defining memories to anchor our commonality with these individuals. But just as we can find a way of understanding time via routes that do not involve remembering past experiences, perhaps we can find a way to form a love that is less a feeling than an intentional act, an insistence on remembering, a demonstration of caring, an intentional effort to define our communities of caring and ourselves in the process. And I have no doubt that episodic memory what we remember, what we choose to remember, what we choose to forget is uh, a crucial component in all of that. Um, just to, to, to end, thank you very much for your time. I need to, to recognize Donna Kwan, who did all of these experiments on discounting with Shana Rosenbaum at York, who's my uh, incredibly valuable collaborator. My good friend and interlocutor, Stan Klein at the University of California, San, Santa Barbara. Farine Vargakadam at the University of Colorado, uh, University College London, who does work with John and who I'm hoping to do um, uh, collaborative work with next summer if I can make it to Europe. Uh, Chloe Steidem and Ben Graham were undergraduate students who helped me to devise these tests. And Len Green and Joel Meyerson are the kings of discounting who helped me to make sure that I wasn't uh, running silly experiments when we uh, did these experiments with people with amnesia. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Carl. That was great. Uh, so, Let me try to have the full screen so that I can see everyone. Uh, okay, good. So um, you can uh, raise your hand with the option at the bottom of the screen. That's the easiest way because we're almost 30. Uh, so uh, if you could raise your hand this way, that would be extremely uh, convenient for me. So are there any uh, questions for Carl?
Okay, can you? Uh, so I have two very different questions. Let me start with a very general one, which is uh, connected with what you said towards the end of your talk. So in terms of, in terms of agency, because you started with agency, what is an agent and the philosophical question, which is also a very important scientific question. And you said um, something towards the end about the type of agency that people with episodic memory have. Can you say a little bit more about, about that? How would you dis describe that, that agency? Yeah, at the moment I'm treating agent person as a, as a holding term. Um, uh, and, and asking, there's obviously an intuitive idea of personhood that's operating in the background of these claims that episodic memory is necessary for it. Um, I don't think at the moment, at, at the moment I'm willing to let the notion of agency and personhood take on whatever contours, I, I would rather let, let, let people bring to me their sense of what's important about agency. And, and I tell them whether people with amnesia can do that or not. Um, this talk is predicated on the assumption that being an agent properly, like it, it, you know, the kind of thing that could be held responsible for its actions, that has reasons for its actions, that re can reflect on what it's doing and why, um, uh, the thought was that that does re to be an agent requires some understanding of a, a, an agent in the proper in that full philosophical sense of the term requires some understanding of that there's a future um, and some understanding that there are consequences of your actions and that your actions will be evaluated in terms of that. So the only thing that I'm using for the purposes of this talk is the idea that you know an agent in a point of time is doesn't make any sense <laughs> um uh agency is to, to be an agent in a in a morally robust sense is to have a sense of the place of your actions in the flow of events to understand what their consequences are but but look i you know uh, uh, to be perfectly frank from the beginning i'm starting with a very americanized individualist conception of what a person is. A thing that has reason and reflection, can consider its reasons for action, can reflect on why it's doing the things that it does. Uh, those are the sorts of things that I take to be paradigmatic, par paradigmatically true of persons. And then I'm curious, how is it that the machinery in our heads makes it possible that we're the kind of thing that can do that? Um, and the ability to imagine the future to construct possible futures, to, to imagine counterfactual futures or counterfactual pasts seems to be part of the apparatus by which we're the kind of thing that reflects on our behaviors. And, and I think that maybe that's part of why people think this form of memory plays such a role for us. Darwin, Darwin says in, um, in The Descent of Man, I think it's The Descent of Man, um, uh, that, that a hunting dog, um, if, if it had episodic memory, well, memory, but he, he meant episodic memory. He says that if a hunting dog had episodic memory, that it would suddenly have the capacity to ask, well, should I really go hunting or should I just sit down and, and enjoy myself? Um, <laughs> that, that, that it's that mnemonic reflective capacity that, that makes us reflective quite generally. Yeah. So I am thinking about something like a reflective, responsible agent that does things for reasons and can ask whether its reasons are good reasons. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have, so please introduce yourself in uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, just to say if you're like a philosopher and you're a scientist or another scientist, that will be useful, I guess, for uh, you know, contextualizing your questions. So Simon is first. And I should also say that I'm, I'm perfectly happy to talk about, if you want to talk about the methodology of dissociation experiments and that kind of thing, I'm, I'm very happy to go there as well. I, I don't, I want this to be a non-naive use of a very old neuroscientific methodology. And if somebody thinks that there's something naive in the way that I'm using this methodology, I would most want to hear it. Anyhow, go, no, that's 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 a good point a good invitation for other questions or maybe uh critiques or or you know uh simon yeah thank you hi 
Uh, yeah, my name is Simon. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Bordeaux in the philosophy of medicine. Ah. Uh, so I really liked your presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, so the idea is that the metaphor of being stuck in time doesn't fit and we have to replace it with something else. But you haven't really talked much about um, what we should put in instead of this metaphor. Do you have yeah. any thoughts on this? Or? Well, I mean, you know, there are options that are available in the neuroscientific literature at the moment that are much more, much more uh, de descriptive than um, the effort to say that they're somehow trapped, trapped in the present. I, what I worry sometimes about Simon, although I think this might be the right outcome, the answer, that what's wrong with somebody with amnesia? <laughs> like, why is it? that having lost your memory um, uh, leaves you so disabled as, as a human being. And there's no doubt about it. These people live at home with their parents. Um, they can't leave their house for long periods of time without getting lost. And, you know, Simon, I think that the answer might be less exciting than most people want. Mm. You know, you have to, like, like, it just turns out that it's important to remember things. <laughs> yeah. um, and and that, that to have a conversation with somebody, it requires that you remember what you've already talked about and what you haven't. It requires, you know, to have a, you know, to have a friendship, for example, it's very, you know, you could, we could maintain something that I think is very much like a friendship under these circumstances. But suppose, suppose that your significant other dies and, and you tell me this and you're heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And then every time I see you, I ask how your significant other's doing. Um, there, there comes a point where the fabric of that social relationship starts to fray or, or you leave the house and you can't remember where you are, where you were going, how to get back home. Um, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, there are just basic facts about remembering what you are. I, I, I think that part of what's going on with people with amnesia is they can't remember what they're doing. Um, they can't see, and this captures something that's right about this metaphor. They, they lose track of what they're doing. They, they need to see their actions in the present as parts of um, more complicated and extended actions. And I think my working hypothesis, and I haven't, I, I'm not sure this is correct, but my working hypothesis is that they, they don't know what they're doing um, <laughs> in, in some Anscomian sense. They know they're pumping, they know they're moving the handle, but they don't know they're poisoning the village. And, and that's an important, uh, that's, so I'm playing with the idea that perhaps they lo they're losing sight of the temporal arc of their actions and, and can't keep track of the place of their current activities in that, in that arc. And that's, that's devastating from an agential point of view, I think. But it's, but it's not saying that they're, you know, you could say, oh, that just means that they're trapped in a present. Well, Okay, but you have to say that they're not trapped in all of the ways that I just demonstrated. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that this is a more perspicuous uh, uh, way of saying what's going, what's going wrong here. Thank you. Yeah. Mael has a question. Hi, Mael. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Carl, for this wonderful talk. It's always a pleasure to hear you. And I, I regret so much that we don't, know, don't have the time actually to, to chat more about these issues and others. Um, so um, you, you have mainly studied one case, but you're aiming, of course, at a more general category of people, uh, people with episodic amnesia. And um, the thing, my concern is that, uh, so I like the way you, you showed that our intuitions uh, don't work actually to understand what is going wrong with these persons. But at the same time, uh, I think it suggests that maybe also uh, the target is, is not well defined. I mean, in terms of, uh, of uh, a class of people that have the same uh, troubles. And I was wondering whether some people with other uh, disturbances might not actually have, um, or, or, or I mean, problems that are, that are described as different might not have actually the same kind of disturbance with uh, uh, maybe um, their perception of time or, or the, the use they make of, um, 
or, or they cannot make with uh, episodic memories or, or stuff like that. I mean, I, I was struck by the fact that some of the description you, you give actually uh, can be also maybe found in people with, I don't know, uh, addiction maybe, or um, schizophrenia or s things that are actually very different or that we categorize as very different from uh, people with uh, amnesia. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Um, uh, so I've been trying to work in in a way that's more like a Broca or a Wernicke, <laughs> um, um, which is um, uh, within a tradition in neuroscience that's attempting to identify subjects that had what we take to be surgical loss of a specific cognitive capacity. What's really striking, I don't think that H, you know, HM and KC are not entirely novel in the world. There are other people who have memory deficits as a result of hippocampal damage or uh, um, a stroke or, um, and, and it's not just to the hippocampus, it could be to the mammillary bodies or, you know, they, and, 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 I, and your point um, of when we draw a circle around these and say, these are a kind <laughs> um, is, is an incredibly uh, difficult matter. Uh, what right now, the kind that I care about for the purposes of this book is not so much defined at the neuroanatomical level, um, though, though that might be helpful in providing clues about um, uh, the differences between them. Um, uh, I'm mostly interested in, in a purely cognitive dissociation that so far as our psychological evaluations illustrate, they have lost episodic memory and for the most part are doing well on other things. The other patient, now of course, these are not the only people who've lost their episodic memories. They're, it's much more common, much more common in the world for people to have episodic memory deficits in the middle of a whole host of other deficits. Um, and so people with autism are known to have episodic memory deficits and people with schizophrenia are known to have episodic memory deficits. And I take it that many people are hoping that they'll understand schizophrenia as partly something that affects the hippocampal system, partly something that affects perceptual systems or, or whatever. Um, uh, and and the, what they're studying is the component that episodic memory plays in those. But, but Maya, you're absolutely right that a lot of what's, a lot of my argument turns on the ability to see these people as having a relatively focal kind of deficit, having preserved function in other areas. And then my conclusions really only follow for those guys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, you, if you talk to me about somebody with schizophrenia, they've got much more than memory deficits or Alzheimer's disease. You know, maybe early Alzheimer's disease looks very much like the people that we're talking about here, but late Alzheimer's disease is accompanied by so many much worse cognitive depth or, you know, so many other cognitive deficits that include one's semantic capacities as well that, um, uh, that they become very messy from the point of view of doing this kind of cognitive neuropsych you know, moral neuropsychology that I'm hoping to do. So, but, but the cognitive ontology question is an important one. And, I'm, and, and for me to get this project up and going, I'm taking for granted the existence of something of a, of a cognitive system, call it a scene construction. I tend to think of it as a scene construction system. Um, the episodic memory is sort of building scenes. Um, uh, yeah, to think of them as having lost, having lost that and being unified in having lost that. But it's an empirical question whether that chunking of these individuals works. I've also moved fluidly between people who have the deficits because of a motorcycle accident or a car accident late in life and people who have these deficits because of some early childhood event and I'm making the assumption that the brains that are left at the end of those two traumas are roughly the same. And that could turn out to be false too. Uh, that's, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Rebecca. Hi, uh, I'm Becco Copenhaver. Um, I'm a philosopher. Um, Carl, I, I like the, the, this idea that you've got that um, the agential damage uh, or debility is a matter of not knowing what you're doing because, but uh, uh, well, 
I'll separate a, a different question. But um, so this this notion so this notion that you don't know what you're doing. Um, do do these um, do these participants um, have a sense of what other people are doing? Right. So they're living with their parents. Right. Uh, do they have a sense of you know mom is making tea or um, and she's making tea because we're having you know th that's what we do you know during the afternoons or something like that. That's, that's a great question. I I don't know the answer to it. Um, uh, uh, you know my my natural inclination is to say I don't see why they wouldn't honestly, but that would also involve time. So. I, it's a, it's a perfectly good question, but we haven't done that test yet. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Did you, Rebecca, have, did you have a follow-up question or a separate question or, or are you done? Well, I just, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused, right? So p part of what you've established is that folks who, um, uh, folks who have ep episodic amnesia are no more stuck in the present than the rest of us, is I guess the way that I would like to put it. Um, but then when you're talking about the agential debility, time comes into play again. So I'm having a hard time reconciling the fact that there's this inherently temporal aspect to the agential debility, but then it looks like on these kinds of time tasks, they're not all that different, right? Does it make sense, the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you're wondering why this hypothesis that I suggested to Simon doesn't run into all of those problems. I have to point out, um, Becca, that the, the, you know, this is really, this is one chapter out of a book that has, has, uh, you know, chapters on other minds and chapters on moral decision making and, and chapters on a whole host on self and, and, um, and so a lot of what happens in the book is me trying to split hairs and chase, chase this phenomenon around and I don't yet have a clear story about what's happening at, at the end, it might be that knowing what you're doing has a temporal component that is preserved in these people, but also has a personal component. What am I doing? What, what, what am I set out to do? Here's the kind of test that I've wanted to get people to do, but have yet to convince anyone to do, Becco. Um, I want to know if they can quit smoking. Oh, that's um, really interesting. And, and because I think, and, and some of them do smoke. So, so I'm, I'm really interested in whether, you know, the, the, the idea that you, you want to quit smoking, um, which would certainly be good for them, um, uh, seems to require having made a decision at a time and then knowing later that you've made that decision, even though your desires in the moment seem to contradict that decision. And then you have to weigh having made the decision against those desires, or at least that's Carl's first pass um, box an arrow diagram of how that how that might work um, uh, that yeah um, that uh, that might involve a temporal component but it might also just it, it involve knowing what you committed it might involve more of a personal com what 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 am I doing what it might be more about the um, uh, keeping track of the self than keeping track of what what happened anyhow I I don't have the positive story worked out. That's, I think, clear enough. And no, most that's, of what's that's, happening that's, is that. That's really helpful. Thank you. And that, and that ties in nicely with my original question about whether they know what other people are doing. So that yeah. might be an interesting thing to think about. Thank you, Carl. It's really yeah, cool. No, I mean, Becca, you, you, maybe when you get here, we can, we can try to work on this a little bit more. That's the portion of the book that's not written yet. And so much of the book is about trying to clear space for us to imagine I don't know if it was clear in the way that I was presenting it today, but part of the thought was that when you start describing someone as trapped in the present or like a rat, um, uh, you're saying things that are really uh, destructive um, and, uh, to them as persons and really insulting to them as persons. Um, that, that they, that I don't think most scientists recognize how, um, well, maybe they do, but, but sometimes they don't seem to recognize how damaging it is to say that somebody's no longer a person in the fullest sense of the word, or that they've lost their humanity in some crucial respect. And, and part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to salvage that and to say that judgment is based on a kind of ableist assumption that working, that having a properly functioned memory is really absolutely crucial to 
our status as the special thing that we are. And I want, it, I want to weaken that intuition in part as a way of saying there's a lot more agency left in these people than, than you would expect. Here's another way, Simon, let me try this and maybe Becca, this, this would be a little bit better. I mean, think about, and it, I think it's the same thought in some ways, but you decide I'm gonna to go to the grocery store and then you make it six, six blocks away from your house and you no longer remember where you're going. And you just forgot, they, you know, you tell somebody you're going to meet them at one o'clock and then you forget you're going to meet them at one o'clock. And there's not a deep diagnosis of really what's gone wrong. They just forget stuff. <laughs> and, and forgetting stuff seems to get in the way of their doing stuff. Um, because doing stuff remi re requires remembering what you've done, what order it should be done in. And, and so there's a relatively just straightforward story on the output end about why these people have such difficulty ordering their lives. And it doesn't require that we have some deep theoretical story about how episodic memory is necessary for having a self or episodic memory is necessary for grasping time or, no, episodic memory is necessary for getting your act together <laughs> and, and, and remembering what you're doing and doing it. That's, I mean, and I said it was a mundane thesis um, in some ways, but it might have the value of being being true. I don't know if that helps Simon and, and Becco or to flesh it out a little bit more to see it as less temporally involved. Absolutely. Cool. Same for me. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Giuseppe. Um, hello. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for your talk. And uh, it was really inspiring and refreshing for me because, uh, uh, well, I'm an assistant professor in uh, physiology and uh, neuroscience in, uh, at the University of Paris. So I'm really out of the field of uh, philosophy. Uh, and uh, I mean, your talk actually changed my scientific daily life. Uh, <laughs> so which is really good. And uh, so I had a couple of questions for you. So maybe they are quite naive, uh, but I mean, for me, they are quite, um, important, let's say. Uh, so what you describe, I mean, I start from the point that uh, learning and memory, they are features, cognitive features, which are common to any kind of uh, animals, from C. elegans to Drosophila to whatever. So uh, I was wondering whether or not what you today shared with us, if this could be applied also to other animals, uh, uh, why? Because we can induce amnesia experimentally uh, in mice. And I don't think, maybe I'm, I may be wrong, the animal have this kind of anthropomorphic notion of time distinguishing past, present, and future. This is a, a really anthropomorphic way to dissect the time. So I was wondering if what you uh, described could be uh, uh, applied to animal, non-human animals. So this is the first question. The second question is how uh, do you conceive uh, the experiment that we like to perform in our labs uh, using uh, optogenetics or chemogenetics, like shutting down neurons, circuit, and induce uh, experimental long-term, short-term amnesia, and how this could be um, uh, mechanistically explain what you, in a cognitive term, have described. Thank you. That's, those, those, are, those are great. Um, the most natural application, I think, to non-human organisms, and, and my collaborators do work across those fields, um, would be in the discounting experiments. Clearly, conceptual knowledge of time you can't talk to rats about the past, the present, and the future, and you can't ask them about what regret is or how they feel when they regret things or stuff like that. But, but both humans and non-human organisms show the tendency to discount the value of delayed rewards. And, and, then the, and, and to my knowledge, nobody has yet done a hippocampal lesion uh, followed by delayed discounting tests in rats, for example. Um, and I think that that's a very natural, I was super, you know, it was really reading Pascal Boyer's work on uh, mental time travel that led me to think, oh, we really have to test whether people with amnesia discount the future like the rest of us. It would be really fascinating to know the answer to that question. 
But, but it turned out that nobody had asked that question to my shock and amazement. So, so we did it. And now I would love, I would, I would be super excited, in fact, if somebody decided that that was a, a test to be done. And there's some justification for it. Peters and Buschel have this um, work now that shows that if you get people to imagine what they'll spend the money on in the future. So we're going to give you a hundred dollars, a hundred euros in, in, in three weeks. Uh, but we want you to imagine the bottle of wine that you're going to spend that, you know, tell me the bottle of wine that you're going to buy with that hundred euros. And, uh, and why don't you describe some of the taste properties that you expect to have in that. And then you get them sort of very excited about, about the future. And then, then you say, okay, now you, you trade the hundred euros versus, you know, 10 euros today. And it turns out that when you, when you prime people to think in rich episodic detail about their futures, that that does tend, in fact, to nudge up the value mm -hmm. of these rewards. So I think it would just be really fasc yeah, I agree. fascinating to see whether non-human organisms <laughs> exhibit this exactly the same. And, and, uh, and actually, this experimental could be easily done in a way uh, that we can, I mean, even without lesioning, we could uh, just silence some neurons in the hippocampus, in the benula, in the mammalian group nuclei, and, and see if there is a evaluation, devaluation, uh, the extinguishing period after decision making. All of this could be, could be easily done. But I mean, you, I, I agree with you that uh, it's, uh, I mean, no one does it. <laughs> I think at the moment, you know, people are so interested in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex yes. in, in association with delayed discounting and choice behavior. That, um, that that's where a lot of the research has gone. In fact, we've got a paper that's in production at the moment on uh, comparing amnesic individual, individuals with amnesic to uh, people who uh, have lesions to the VMPFC and, um, and comparing the results. People who have lesions to the VMPFC are, um, uh, display very different <laughs> discounting behavior than people with amnesia. And I would love to see somebody do exactly that experiment in rats, um, for example. Um, and I think that we, I think we would learn an awful lot from that study. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone working on rats? Oh, Christopher, maybe. Uh, yeah. Turn on your. Yeah. Good. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, I'm, I'm working with mice. No, I was putting my hand up for, for a question. <laughs> um, can, I, can I ask I think, I, think, I think mice discount the future, too. Um, <laughs> we could do it in mice, too. Um, I mean, since, since I work in mice, I'm, I'm very much of the, the school of uh, mice can do almost anything you can do with rats. We have to de defend our, our choice to work with mice every, every chance we get. <laughs> And they're good for genetics. I mean, if we had a genetic component in all of this, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm a PhD student uh, in philosophy and neuroscience. And yeah, we do uh, experiments in episodic memory in mice and in humans in the team. But my question is like 100% from classical philosophy. Um, I, I was thinking from the beginning that uh, in what you were saying that it would seem that semantic memory would be able to work as a proxy for uh, episodic memory in constituting time and then you address that which was was great with the cases of john and uh, hc so i'm definitely going to look into that but it did kind of leave open uh, a question a kind of um uh, a comparative question to mary and the black and white room um like could we in in your opinion if someone learned everything that there is to know semantically about time, having never had an episodic memory, when they have an episodic memory, do they learn something new about uh, time? And, and just to give another angle on that, that I was thinking of when you were talking, it reminded me as well of the debate between Bergson and Einstein, uh, where Bergson like presented this whole thing. And then at the end of his talk about time, he said, could we not say that there are two times? There is the time of physics, which is your time, but maybe there is also another time, which is philosophical time. And famously, Einstein said, no, there is just one time. Um, so yeah, those, just that, that idea. Is there something that can be learned about time, a sense of time, 
that is totally independent of the semantics of science. And, and besides which, thanks very much for the talk. It was excellent. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, I think that's, that's just, it's just a terrific way of framing the question and a really, really interesting uh, version of it. Let me, instead of answering it directly right off the bat, um, advertise a book by Craig Callender. It's uh, called What's So Special About Time? Um, it's a 2017 book. I think it's really excellent. And there are the fundamental question of the book is, um, you know, he's, he's among the people who thinks that physics has shown us that the, there is, the A series is, at best, a psychological reality. It's, the, the, the physics has no need for the A series. Time does not flow. Time does not change. It is not, it is not a river. It is not, it is, you know, they, they have various ways of explaining what's going on. But, but for him, the question is, how do we make sense of the fact that our lives seem to play out in time, given the fact that physics tells us that time, that the A series doesn't exist? Or, uh, basically, that's, that's, my short version of what he's trying to do in the book. So all of this is really about not what we're going to learn about time, but what we might learn about the human human concept, the human concept of time, and where where that comes from. I, I um, uh, Jerry Vieira um, um, has done a bunch of work on this, uh, showing that you know time is built into our cells, um, uh, and that we have systems for tracking time all over the brain and all over our bodies. And, and I would rather think that our sense of time really comes from some kind of combination of those, of those, um, of those different systems. Um, uh, yeah, uh, would you learn something new? I, that's, that's really kind of a question about, con the way you've put it is, makes it a question about consciousness or something like, that suddenly I'm aware, like I feel the flow of time. And often when I give these talks, people say like, but can you, but does Casey feel time flowing or does HM notice the passage of time? And I think he notices the passage of time. Does he feel time? I don't know if I feel, I'm not sure that I feel time flowing. I, <laughs> I see events happening about me, but I don't, I'm not even sure what I, what the feeling of the passage time of, of time is supposed to be. So, so I would rather ask the question, what does the store, so let's think of episodic memory as the storage of particular events um, from a first person perspective. What does the ability to do that give us that other, and, and let's, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of doing evolutionary psychology, but let's just ask the question, why, why would nature have equipped us? Why, why would we persist in equipping ourselves with a system that stores individual conscious events when, when it could just have done perfectly well by add, making us have bigger semantic memories. I think that that is a fundamental question for memory research right now. What does episodic memory do that semantic memory um, uh, cannot? And I think that's a, I think that's a, why, you know, you're pulling marbles out of an urn. You could keep track of the percentage of reds and whites, but why do you need to keep track of the individual marbles? You might just update your semantic knowledge of the world on the basis of these individual experiences and then flush away the individual experiences. So the question then becomes, what's so important about these individual experiences? And here, let me, let me point you in the direction of um, Johannes Marr's work. Johannes Marr is a postdoc at Harvard right now, working with Dan Schachter. He published an article in BBS um, with, um, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the, the, the other author. Does anyone know it offhand? It's um, Mar and Chibra, uh, C-S-I-B-R-A. And what those guys are pursuing, and I think it's really interesting, is that our social dynamic might require these particular events. Um, the fact that I said I was going to meet you or that I promised you that I would give you $5 tomorrow for the hamburger that I got today, um, the, require that we keep tr maybe keep track of these dated, maybe there's a lot about our social lives that requires keeping track of these particular past, past events that they happened at a particular time and not at some other time is actually relevant to their significance. I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say things that are that are ridiculous, and so I'm I'm holding myself back. But maybe you get the kind. 
maybe there's a social need to keep track of particulars, um, particular events. Whereas the world itself might be, it might be that we can get along perfectly well in much of the world by just tracking regularities. But, but you know, it's important that, you know, I remember a train ride with Mile, um, if we're going to come back to a conversation that we started on that train ride, for example, and, uh, and that that will help us to, or that if I know that I've made a promise to somebody or made an agreement with somebody, that those are dated, those are dated things. Uh, so Mar and Chibra are pushing this idea that maybe the natural home for episodic memory is in the social. And I think that's worth exploring. Okay, I'll look into that, thanks. And then whether, how social mice are and what role it might play in the social world of mice, I don't, I don't know. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions. Oh, Aline. Uh, please turn on, yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful, Wonderful talk. Um, I am working with uh, Christopher and I'm working with mice, uh, episodic memory with, with mice. And I do believe that they have episodic memory. And um, I almost believe that they have some sense of time uh, regarding the past. Uh, I'm not sure about thinking about future, but regarding the past, I'm pretty sure they, they are able to do it. But um, I, 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 want, I wanted to just uh, have a comment. First, uh, my personal opinion is that to answer your question about why do we have episodic memory for? Uh, why semantic memory? Why just not only um, very efficient, big semantic memory system? Uh, why episodic memory is so important. I do believe that um, uh, I have this idea that episodic memory is a system to uh, remember something that is varying uh, um, in contrast to semantic memory, which would be more the capability to remember what is um, regular, okay? And I also have this idea that um, uh, episodic memory is only a relatively short-term memory system. I think that we don't really have the proof that long-term episodic memory really exists. And my opinion is rather that uh, we, we learn about our uh, old memories because we, we repeat them because we, okay? So progressively, either we remember past, long-term past events because they were important, because we talked about them very often and so on. And, but it's not really episodic memory, it's more was semantic memory and if the events are not important or we just don't remember them so my view is in fact that um, long-term episodic memory does not exist and I, I I'm not sure that we do really have strong evidence for the opposite of this uh, of my point and um, uh, so th this was just to have a, an answer to your, your question. And, and I wanted to, to make a comment on the fact that um, your, your talk was very interesting. I was just thinking um, uh, episodic memory, amnesic, episodic amnesia is, um, it, we, do have the, we do have evidence that amnesic patients um, still have uh, some capability in the brain to store the past, but they have lost the capability or, or the memory they have of the past is not accessible to them in a, in a, in a conscious, in an uh, explicit 
uh, manner, okay? But in fact, that they still have, their, their brain still have some capability to remember and to remember some kind of very specific events. I am thinking of the, the, the illustration that was given by uh, Claparet uh, about this uh, uh, amnesic patient uh, that he, he, he decided, Claparet once decided to uh, shake the hand of the patient with a, um, with a, an aiguille, Christopher, comment on dit aiguille? A, a, a needle. A needle. A needle, yeah. With a needle in, a, in his hand. Uh, so the, the patient was hurt when he, he, he shake the, the hand. So next time when he, 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 he met the, the claparet again, the patient refused to shake the hand of uh, claparet. Okay, although he, he wouldn't remember, he, 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 he wouldn't remember having uh, seen Claparet, having met Claparet before, and he wouldn't remember consciously having been hurt by shaking the hand to Claparet before. But nevertheless, he, he has some, some trace of this event in, in his uh, memory, okay, in his brain. I, I don't know how to call it. Um, so I was wondering how could this um, uh, consideration could um, affect your point? Um, isn't this, what, well, I, uh, I stop because my English is uh, awful, I, I apologize for it. Uh, I hope you understand what, you understood what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I, th I think I did. It's a very rich set of comments and questions. And uh, let me try to, to uh, say things about a few of them. And uh, I just wish that we could sit down over coffee and have this conversation properly because yeah, there's yeah. obviously an awful lot of, of stuff for us to, to share here. Um, uh, you know, the question of whether there's episodic memory in non-human animals is, of course, a fraught one. Um, and I do hope that in the end, my book has something to say. You know, I, I, I do have some things to say about about that. I think we often talk about episodic memory in very different ways. And on some descriptions, it would be reasonable to locate it in non-human animals and on other descriptions, unreasonable to do so. But but let's leave that fraught debate where it is. We could talk about corvids and elephants and uh, all of that, but, uh, or even just, you know, uh, Eichenbaum's work, or uh, but but um, that's controversial. I love the idea that maybe it has to do with varying phenomena in the short term. That um, and I assume that what you mean is that if I have to keep if there's something that could shift states over time, but I have to know what state it's in now to act appropriately. That sounds like the kind of thing that I that sounds related to what I was saying, where they don't know what they're doing or they can't. There's an output problem. It's mm -hmm. It's, it's knowing um, uh, what, when to act and when to do the right thing and what you've already done. And, and so I think that if, if that, that hypothesis is a really interesting one that I'd like to look at more. Um, the Clapperhead case, I often use, I mean, I mean you're, you, you are pointing to a really difficult problem uh, with neuropsychology generally. Um, you, the brain is damaged the behavior looks as if a cognitive capacity has been lost. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a problem, there's, a there's always the possibility that that cognitive capacity remains, but we've merely lost access to it um, uh, mm -hmm. via a few key routes. And we take the fact that we've lost that access to it by a few key routes to mean that the whole thing has been lost. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you perfectly well know, separate it, it is a problem for the neuropsychology of memory yes. that we cannot distinguish the, 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 the cases in which somebody has lost their store of episodic memories or merely lost their ability to retrieve those memories okay. and so one thing that you know one thing you could say about all of this is that casey is misunderstood um casey is not properly said amnesic um, Casey has difficulty reporting his memories, but he has them all. And similarly for HM, and similarly for HC, and similarly for DA. And I mean, you know, from, from the perspective of the people that I typically work with, they're gonna start thinking that that's gonna look ad hoc. That the only time, you know, 
<laughs> they, they have episodic memories. It's just that it doesn't make contact with their discounting behavior, with their ability to talk about those memories, with their ability to, and then, you know, in all of the tests that we do, you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying, that um, uh, uh, we have lots of indication that they don't remember things. There are lots of tasks that they can't perform that seem to rely on their memories. Um, the cluster of those that they fail on have to be explained in a unitary way that allows it to be the case that the store could still be there and, and still be output in these other behavioral mechanisms. Typically people treat Clapared, the Clapared case as something as a mix of procedural memory, um, you know, pulling your hand away from a hot fire. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that it, but this that is it, not a very, this is not a good argument, I think. Because it is not the case that he would, he would refuse to shake hands to anybody or to anyone. He, he, he would refuse to shake, to shake hands to Clapared. So, ah, but, but when asked why, and so the way that this story gets report, reported is that when you ask him, or, and, and one thing that happens in this literature is that there are all these patients and they all meld in, into one in our minds. Um, but, but often when, when memory researchers talk about this case, and I, they, they um, uh, will say that when you ask Clapperad or KC, why will you not shake, or, or um, uh, Boswell, why will you not shake my hand? Uh, they say, because doctors sometimes have pins in their hands. Um, now that's not Clapperad, but it's doctors. <laughs> um, and, and that answer sounds exceptionally semantic. Um, and so when I said it was a combination of the procedural and the semantic, yeah, I'm imagining that the procedural is handled by the same thing that would keep you from touching the flame again. And then when asked to explain, you've got a semantic, you've, you've formed semantic knowledge that doctors sometimes hide hand, pins in their hands, but you don't remember having been stuck before. There's a, there was a, a case that I was involved in translating uh, from German to English a few years ago, the case of Mr. B. He had carbon monoxide poisoning in this really severe um, uh, uh, kind of memory loss that resulted from it. And uh, this was at a time when in order to image the brain, they injected air into the spinal column and then a bubble would be, would bubble up into the ventricles and then they would tilt the subject on a table to, to image the contours of the ventricles. And he had to go, and this was a very unpleasant um, uh, procedure to go through and he went through that and at some point later they brought him back into the room in which they had done that and he became so agitated that he broke free of all of the people and ran out of the hospital and down the street now now that's incredibly moving if you asked him what he was running from he didn't know he just said he wanted to go home um, <laughs> um, but clearly something is left mm -hmm. I, I didn't even come close to touching your questions, but thank you. So those are really good questions. No, no. Well, this is this is part of the reason why you will have to visit us in Bordeaux uh, at some point in the near future. Uh, we still have uh, seven minutes at most, and still two questions. So I would, okay, Cedric, you. Okay. Sorry, I was so, just saying you can you can just ignore my my hand raised. Uh, I will send an email to, to call for... Okay, okay, good to know. So it means, uh, Valentina, we have a little bit of, you know, we have five minutes for your question and answers, please. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. I'm uh, Valentina Lacorte. I'm an assistant professor in uh, Paris. Um, and um, I, I have a, a little comment. Um, uh, Toma, uh, Valentina? Yeah, can, I, can I interrupt you? Uh, Toma, I hate to do, could you give me just a moment, uh, yeah. a, a break? Uh, could you, could, oh. Can I have just a brief? Sure, uh, it's, yeah, sure, sure. 30 seconds, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's, it's been long.
terribly sorry to interrupt uh, Valentina. <laughs> I'll continue. Uh, and also, um, thank, thank you very much for citing uh, our paper with Dalla Barba in uh, 2013. <laughs> um, so um, actually, I, I had worked with Gianfranco Dalla Barba when I uh, when I was uh, a postdoc uh, here in Paris. And uh, um, so um, my, my, my comment is about uh, a distinction that maybe we can, we can do uh, between uh, the semantic knowledge of time. So uh, the fact that uh, amnesic patients can be able uh, to, um, uh, to do the dis a distinction between the past, the present and the future. And uh, uh, what we, we have called, what Dalla Barba called temporal consciousness. So the, uh, the consciousness of the personal time that, uh, uh, that is uh, mostly related to the maintain of the phenomenological continuity um, of the self. And uh, um, the, maybe a, a, a clear example of, of this case is uh, what, um, what we can observe sometimes in a confabulating patients, that the confabulations affect the, the personal past, but also uh, sometimes personal futures. And uh, um, what we, we showed uh, was that in confabulation, confabulating patients, so they have a, a, um, uh, a, a a deficit of temporal consciousness, so in uh, uh, personal temporality, but to, they can, uh, uh, they, they are able to, uh, to remember information uh, from uh, semantic uh, memory and also uh, they, they can also foresee uh, events in, uh, uh, in semantic uh, non-personal future. So uh, what do you think about about uh, about this distinction. I, I uh, as as with the previous question, I wish that we had some time, uh, Valentina, to to sit yeah. down and try to figure out what temporal consciousness is, and how I've touched it. My efforts to engage with your work on this, which I do think is fascinating, and I you know I think that that it's a real it's it's easy to forget for people who aren't as deep in it as as you are. Um, that, that patients don't read on their head, they, they don't come with labels, uh, mm -hmm. episodic amnesic, um, temporal confabulator, no sense of time, um, that, these, that, to, that to recognize somebody as fitting into one of these categories is a major achievement. And as Miles' question pointed out, putting, finding the, the, the appropriate categorical structure in which to put them is also a difficult one. And so your efforts to talk about forms of temporal consciousness strikes me as, you know, incredibly ambitious, an incredibly ambitious bit of cognitive ontology and, um, and, and a fascinating one. I we need to know a little bit more, I think, about what exactly temporal, you know, so, so, KC can organize the events of his life on a timeline, but that for you is not temporal consciousness. I, I mean, my, my, my worry is at what point, you know, he, he knows that there's a past, he cares about the past, he attributes value <laughs> to the future, he, um, uh, you know, they regret things that might have just happened. And so, so, so then there's this re residue of temporal consciousness um, that I'm, I'm left trying to understand what it is if it's not accounted for by the variety of tasks that we've been trying to do. Can you just help me out a little bit more about what you have in mind? Yeah, no, just I, I temper, actually in the, in, within the framework of the Dalla Barba model, temporal consciousness is defined as the consciousness of the uh, personal own past present and the future is the kind of consciousness that allows individuals to travel over the personal time axis but it is different from what he called knowing consciousness it is another kind of consciousness related to semantic uh, memory uh, you know to, so the b series would be yeah. an expression of that semantic self-knowledge yeah which, yeah which, yeah and, and then you know i think we are back to this question that we got earlier about the you know, what, what, you know, the Mary, the color scientist, you know, what, <laughs> what, what do you get out of having temporal consciousness 
that you don't get out of all of the semantic things that contribute to our sense of, to what is the thing that temporal consciousness adds? Do you have a, do you have a thought about how to answer that question or? Uh, no, I, I, I agree with you. This is, I think that this is a, a, um, a very interesting point because uh, I am, I'm also agree with, uh, with you uh, for, for this point because um, temporal, we, for sure, it's not possible to consider temporal consciousness com mm, completely, um, uh, I don't know, uh, completely separated from uh, semantic, uh, semantic knowledge or semantic uh, um, uh, or knowing consciousness in the in the model in the Dalla Barba models, but. Uh, um, I hope to have the opportunity to meet you uh, personally very soon to discuss uh, about all this. And, uh, that would that would be terrific, absolutely terrific. I um, I, I I mean I should say that just because I'm a philosopher and I've worked on consciousness, you know, the consciousness yeah. has been buzzing around my head mm. from the <laughs> days that I started working on this, and I and I got grumpy about it at some point. And I find that when Endel Talding, you know, when Endel Talding went from the what, where, when to autonoesis, that he defined episodic memory in a way that made it nearly impossible to talk about whether it exists in rats or corvids or, <laughs> and, and part of the fight between him and Nikki Clayton is really about the fact that we don't have any yeah. way to access yeah. the inner life of the rat or the inner life of the corvid. And unless you know what their inner life is like, you can't say whether they're really having episodic memories. Yeah. So I tend to, I mean, in, in general, I, I want, I have, I would hanker, not that I'm, not that I'm a behaviorist in any way, but I would really, I, I really like to anchor my cognitive terms to tasks mm -hmm. that, that uniquely pick out those, those forms of cognition. Mm -hmm. And, I, and when we get to forms of consciousness, I have difficulty identifying those tasks. And I think that's partly why we have difficulty when we try to apply those concepts or, those, or similar tasks in corvids or uh, in elephants or that the, those tasks can be performed without having the inner light or <laughs> um, and, and we don't know what tasks to use. And so, and you know, one might think when we, where we don't have the tasks, one shouldn't have the constructs. Um, uh, or, or that, you know, if there aren't tasks there, um, uh, be careful with the construct. And, and I have to say that temperamentally, that's my attitudes. I would, I would prefer to try to, to understand these psychological constructs in ways that they're really, they can really can be tied down to experimental arrangements yeah. and, and um, but when we have this conversation we will we, we can hammer out those differences between us <laughs> um, uh, but really i'm interested in what temporal consciousness is and how we would test it and what it contributes to our lives i think that it's uh, it's very similar to automatic consciousness but uh, i think that dalla barba is not agree with this <laughs> but but you know i do think that this idea that if we understood it not in terms of some let me let me leave you with this, and, and I'm going to again plug for this uh, Johannes Marr and uh, Georgi Chibra article, which I know is going to be unpopular among scientists. Uh, um, but the, you know they think of episodic memory as a way, uh, as a kind of forgive me for using this term. It's it's like playing a trump card in a game. Um, that when you say I remember that, and that what you're what you're saying is I experienced it firsthand. And so I'm in a privileged epistemic position with respect to what happened then. And, and, and so I rather like that way of thinking, you know, episodic memory is, is a capacity in, in humans, or at least, you know, the full, full blown episodic memory is a capacity by which we know what happened to us. Um, and we know it in a privileged way. We didn't hear it, it's not hearsay or something that we read in a book but something that we know on the basis of our firsthand experience. And then the, the question is, how do you build a system that keeps track of the things that you've experienced yourself as such? And I'm not sure that I need the spotlight of consciousness to, to articulate that kind of thought, but it gets at autonoesis because it's, it's that it happened to me. And, and I wonder if we can do that without this 
kind of conscious spotlight. But I really, I, I really wish we had some time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that was great, both the talk and the Q and A's. Thank you so much, Carl, because you took the the time to uh, really consider each question in detail. That was really great. So, really, thank you very much, and we, you know, we really look forward uh, uh, to your uh, visit, uh, to your visit in in Bordeaux. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see when. Uh, so, um, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to all the participants. Um, I hope we can see you soon, Carl, and uh, have a very nice day. Thank you again for your, for your talk. That was great. Thank you, and thank you all for your time. Bye, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.